We all have that one game that we often look back to as we grew up. Mine was Jan the Ark. Probably the best JRPG you have never played. Now what was it that made this game so memorable to me? The tactical gameplay, the awesome transformation, or was it a simple yet meaningful story about war, hate, and how our colorful cast of characters deals with their own inner struggles? Not only that, we also have the original soundtrack to contend with. Although I must say that some of them might be hit or miss, but when they hit, it's usually a crit. The examples being the voice acting for this game was nothing short of phenomenal as well, and basically fit with the French setting of the game. Now, if you didn't know, Level Five Studio hired voice actors that can do French accent to voice the characters of French heritage in the anime cutscenes, which is a very nice touch needed to make the settings feel more natural. Jean was voiced by Kari Walgreen, who would then later voice Artoria Pendragon in the Fate series, a character that was also mistaken for Jean the Arc by one of her contemporaries. Now, the story for this game was loosely based from the tale of Jean of Arc, a real historical figure who fought and commanded a small army during the Hundred Years' War between French and English, in which some historians will argue that she was the most instrumental at ending the war. Born as a simple peasant girl in the small town of Domremy during the 14th century, Jeanne, at the tender age of 17, would receive visions from who she claimed to be angels, messengers of God, of how dark times are fast approaching France, and that she needs to step up and defend her beloved country, unless their land be taken by the English and the people oppressed. Now, take all the historical facts and add a little dose of Japanese magic into it, and voila! You get yourself a unique plot for a JRPG. Now, speaking of the plot, as I mentioned before, the story is very loosely based on the Hundred Years' War. Only this time, magic and demons are involved. Before the events of the game, there was a war fought between humanity and demons from hell. Leading the demons were a demonic being named Gilvarot, a shapeless evil bent on conquering the human world and enslaving everyone in it. Now, in order to combat this evil, Five magical armlets was created. Each armlet bestows upon its chosen wielder an imaginable power, which soon proves to be the very edge they needed in order to seal back the ancient fiend. Years had passed after the war. The ancient evil was then released back onto the world as one of the heroes decided to betray their own and had Gilvar take over the body of the young Prince Henry VI, effectively giving the control of the entire English kingdom to the devil on the silver platter. In the small town of Domremy, we now follow the main character Jean and her friend Leanne. From the very first scene featuring these two, you can kinda get an early feel for their character. Jean is very headstrong and brash, the kind who will not back down regardless of anything that stood in their way, which is sort of a double-edged sword with how often she places herself in danger and caring of her friend's worries. While Leanne is very meek and more soft-spoken, very much the polar opposite of Jean as she tends to depend on others a lot. They were assigned a small task of delivering some medicinal herbs to the local church. There they had an encounter with a wounded knight, close to death, delivering a strange satchel and an even stranger passenger hidden inside all of the cabinets. Soon after, they were then ambushed by demons that were chasing the knight, presumably being the ones that inflicted the fatal blow on him. Cornered with no way out, Jean heard a strange voice inside her head, urging her to take up the sword. And thus, that's where her journey first began. Many will argue that Jean Diar lacks originality in the gameplay department, with it being compared a lot to the Firebomb series and Final Fantasy Tactics or any other grid based tactical RPG that precedes it for mostly remaining the same. But for Level 5 Studio first attempt at a tactical RPG, the gameplay is nothing but polish brimming with depth and charm just enough to make it stand out and shine on its own. Right off the bat, you are given control of both Jean and Lian. Both are the swordsman type, meaning they can only wield sword type weapons at all times and are unable to change weapon types, as do all the other party members you will meet down the line. This is because classes in this game are predetermined, 
But what you can do, however, is customize your party members to have their own specific role by equipping them with certain skills as according to their stats and weapon types. Now, when you select one of your characters with the marker, you are given the options ranging from move, attack, items, status, and weight. You move your unit close towards an enemy, and when you're in range, you press attack, which will then show you your strike range and the battle forecast. However, do note that the battle forecast isn't always accurate, and the damages inflicted will often fluctuate between higher or lower, but never strays far from the numbers it initially presented. The direction the enemy unit faces will also affect the damage taken. Generally, you will dish out more damage by attacking from the sides and even more from their back. This will force them to turn in your direction in order to counterattack, leaving their sides and back exposed for another unit to exploit. This mechanic extends to your party members as well, so do be careful with how you position your units when you order them to wait, as the enemy's AI will more often than not take advantage of your troop positioning and strike. Lastly, with this game being a turn-based tactical RPG, the duration of each battles are limited by a set amount of turns that you normally have to complete by clearing the designated objectives before you use them all up. There are no incentives to beating the stage as fast as you can or within a set limit, which I feel is like a missed opportunity. After both Jan and Lian finish off the orcs, they then met up with Roger, a fellow resident of their little town a mysterious man who had wandered off into Domremi by accident and cannot recall where he came from nor what he did before. Hearing a scream from somewhere in their town, they then headed off in a hurry in that direction, but by the time they got there, Domremi had already been lost, set ablaze by an unknown enemy. None of the villagers from before can be seen, seemingly already being killed off in the raid, leaving no survivors. It was then that we learned the motive and the culprit behind this attack, because as it turns out, the satchel the wounded knight was carrying actually contains one of the five magical armlets, seemingly stolen from the royal family of England, and was the reason why this English officer and his packs of orcs was chasing after him. But little did they know, the armlet had already attached itself to John. The state starts. You and your party members are now fighting amidst the burning wreckage of Domremy, mysteriously absent of any wounded or dead civilians, victims of the raid. You have been given a new party member, Roger. Another swordsman type. Not that much different from Jean or Lien at first, but you can see where their use starts to differ as you continue to level them up. The only objective you have on this stage is to annihilate every single enemy on the map. Three blue orcs, one red orc, and an English officer right at the very end of the map. So, not only are you outnumbered by enemies who are equipped with offensive skills that can take out a sizable chunk of your HP away, but the loose condition being Shul John falls in battle, the game is immediately over. At the same time, you are being pressured to be aggressive. The enemy's positions are spread in a way that will force you to split your group into two. The red orc won't move at all from his own spot unless one of your troops enter his strike range, but even then, a single unit quite clearly won't be enough to take it out, so you need another unit to either provide healing support or chip it with the damage. But there leaves only one party member left to confront these three blue orcs, who despite being weaker than their red counterpart, have the advantage in numbers. At this point of the tutorial, you find yourself outnumbered, outmatched, with time not even on your side. Your healing items are limited, and two of your party members are wielding wooden sticks for goodness sake. Forget about reaching the enemy commander. You are just trying to keep your troops alive at this point. You are not sure how long you can last, but then... The armlet. Hold it. Aloft.
in an old interview with Level Five. They were asked the question, "How is the combat system in Jandiar unique for a turn-based strategy RPG?" And amongst the reason they gave out was that the transformation feature. Simply put, there are special characters that can wield the magical armlets, as shown in the prologue. These armlets bestows upon their wielder some form of holy armor that not only enhances their stats through the roof, but also grants them a set of powerful skill that allows you to just make means meet out of your enemies. One of these skill is Godspeed. Each time Jean slays an enemy while transformed, Godspeed will then activate. It allows her to take an extra turn with no strings attached, and will continue to do so until she ends her turn with no more kills. One thing I love about this skill was that it is very much exploitable. By tactically picking your enemies, you can pretty much carve your way through the entire map in a single turn, provided that Shuldi condition is good enough. This is how you make it to the English officer, sitting right at the very edge of the map. But a few things to note is that the transformation itself doesn't last very long. At most, you only have two turns to fully utilize its power. Afterwards, you are unable to use that transformation again for the duration of the stage. Although, as you progress through the story, you'll obtain many more transformation options through gems and recruit other characters that have their very own armlets to use. Another thing is that in order to transform, each armlet bearer needs to accumulate enough SP first, which is short for soul power. After each turn, armlet bearer will obtain one soul power. Each armlet starting transformation will only need three SP to invoke. But later transformation obtained through story progression or side quests will often need four or even five SP. So, immediately after transforming, the rest of the stage should be cakewalk. When you eventually make it to the enemy commander, you can pretty much annihilate him with Jan alone without any trouble at all. Therefore, ending the stage. With their home burned down and everyone they knew and loved presumed to be dead, they pile up whatever they can scavenge and prepare for the journey to bring the fight to the English. Two country girls and an outsider, forming a trio of unlikely heroes that just might save the country from being taken over. With the whole thing being entirely Jean's idea, and caring whether or not they will be heading straight into danger, the perfect example of how brash and single-minded she could be when she prevalently believes in something. Lian remarked that wherever Jan goes, she will go, unwittingly casting herself as Jan's shadow. Unable to form her own decision, and is largely dependent on the friend to decide what is best. Meanwhile, Roger is uncertain of this idea, but his attempt to change her mind is to no avail. Ultimately, joining them as he just couldn't leave them on their own. Together, then they set off to Fenkulers. What are you going to do? Jean, no! I must go. I cannot lie down when they have trampled our honor. Oh, you're right, Jean. We should not give in. If you are familiar with the tale of Joan of Arc, then you surely know of her military exploits, her feats, and eventually her death. Much of the story and military campaign she took part in remains the same as her real-life counterpart. If you discounted the overall fantasy element of the game, of course, many of the struggles and battles she took part in are translated well into the game, alongside many of her supporters that she meets in her journey. To name a few, being Jean de Mays, Bertrand de Plongy, La Hire, the renowned French commander, and the infamous Gilles de Rays. Despite her self-proclaimed message from God, her petition for military escorts to Chinon in order to gain audience with the Dauphin was rejected time and time again by the garrison commander Robert de Beaucourt, 
who almost considered her for a lunatic for her ridiculous claims. It was also around this time when she first met and gained the support of Jean de Mays and Bertrand, two noblemen who then pledged their support to her cause. It was after a recent struggle that she heard the voice again, this time telling her to head to the city of Nancy in order to gain audience with the Duke. But before that, let me explain some other bits regarding the combat mechanics. For this stage, you obtain two new party members, Jean and Bertrand. Jean is a spear wielder, a unique weapon type that can strike both at close range or some distance away, preventing enemy counters unless they too wield the spear. Not only that, should two enemies be adjacent to one another, you can pierce through your first opponent while striking his fellow for reduced damage, which is very useful if you know how to utilize it in the fight. Meanwhile, Bertrand is another swordsman, but a bit more tank-oriented one. Now, each time you strike an enemy, notice how there's a red fire ring behind them now. This is called Burning Aura, some sort of damage modifier that will increase the amount of damage you dish out. Every hit that connects will always generate a feel of Burning Aura, and among other things, Burning Auras can both be stacked on top of one another, and even carried around by your troops should the condition is right. That is, when a unit is already on top of the spot the Burning Aura was generated. Also, Whenever your troops are attacked, Unified Guard will activate. It functions as some sort of damage reduction based on the amount of allies that are in the vicinity of the unit that is receiving the attack. Both these mechanics in essence are meant to encourage you to move your troops as one singular unit. Using basic tactics such as flanking the enemies in order to deal the most amount of damage and standing in solidarity with your peers in order to lessen the burden on one single individual. These are essential tools for you to fight through each stage as despite the relatively easy difficulty of the game, you will eventually find yourself overwhelmed by continuous onslaught of higher level enemies as you continue your progress. It was also on the stage that you are given the option to sort your equipment and skills through the preparation menu. Throughout the world map, there are some locations that also serve as item shops, in which you can purchase the latest equipment or sell the things you feel you will need. The quality of the item sold ties into your progress through the story as the few starting locations will barely sell you anything, while late game will offer a lot more useful items and equipment. You can equip these items in the preparation menu before each fight. You are also able to augment your skills by inserting skill stones. These skill stones are divided into four types. Red being the offensive oriented, green being your magic spells, while purple and blue serves as some sort of passive enhancement, able to increase your stats or add a few traits in. Speaking of traits, these are purely optional, but have the potential to make the game easier for you or increase the difficulty up a notch. Throughout the game, you will encounter many enemies or even allies with either the sun, moon, and star icon in their description. These are some of the traits I was talking about, functioning as some sort of rock paper scissor mechanic, which is oddly enough, entirely optional, branded as soul spirit, luna spirit, and stella spirit. In terms of the order, soul beats stella, stella beats luna, while Luna beats Soul. You can equip these traits into your troops for a more rounded up approach to battle, or opt out of this mechanic as to not give the enemy any more inch in battle. Although should you decide to use it, you are generally encouraged to preview the whole map first and check for enemy traits before initiating the stage. On their way to Nancy, they encounter a nobleman who will later know as Gilles de Reis, alongside his escort. Now, it is universally agreed upon that escort missions are usually the worst sort of mission, especially when you have to keep all yourself alive along with your escortee. For this stage, you are under no circumstances to let Gillis die, while his companion is not so lucky as to share such privilege. Regardless of what you do, you'll never reach that soldier in time. Not only is his defenses peppered thin, the enemy type he faced has 95% accuracy while dealing massive amount of damage. So, I will assume he's just fated to die no matter what you do. In the preparation menu, do equip the heal and fireball spell on Lian. Stat-wise, her melee and blood is rather pitiful, dealing little to no damage while also more likely to die by a right of a counter-attack. That is why I assign her as the party's makeshift mage, at least until we can recruit a proper one later on. The heal spell is rather vital for the stage, as you might not be able to reach Gilles in time. As such, you will require the ability to heal over long distances just in case Gilles might not make it, or else it's an instant game over when he dies. 
Afterwards, you share some words with him and later meet him again in Nancy, on the Duke's chamber before parting ways. This sickly bedridden old man that sits before you is the Duke of Lorraine. The Duke originally called for your party here in hopes that whatever sickness he have might be cured by the armlet's holy power. But a short conversation with Gillis reveals that not only is it not possible, it is also pointless as the Duke is already in his twilight years. Healthy or not, sooner or later, he will pass anyway. Rushing off Gillis come inside, the Duke then tasks Jan with a quest to save France, claiming she will be able to do it since she possesses one of the armlets that once saved the world. She will first need to head to Chinon, to the court of the Dauphin, in order to force him out of hiding and start the campaign to take back Paris. On their way, they were accosted by Talbot, a high-ranking English commander that leads a platoon that is solely made out of demon kind. And just like that, we start off the fifth stage. So, this is where the difficulty starts to ramp up a bit. This is an escape stage. You are to guide your little army through the entire map and place them one by one on this yellow marker that represents the escape route. Problem is, it is guarded by Talbot, this game's recurring enemy unit that appears time and time again to hinder your way. He possesses some rather impressive stats and mobility, with which he can use to catch up to your slower party member and promptly annihilate them with one or two hits. Oh, and did I mention that you are not to let a single party member fall in battle, because it's an instant game over if you do. Which is why I consider this stage to be a massive difficulty spike. Not only that, there are multiple archers and lizard spearmen with an impale skill placed across the map, ensuring that you'll constantly be pressured to move and make sure everybody's HP are at good enough level, unless you want them to be sniped off from a distance. Fortunately, before the duke sees you off, he entrusted your party's safety to two of his retainers, Colette and Marcel, who promptly joins your party. Colette is the thief type, a rogue that specializes in high mobility, high critical and evasion rate, while possessing little to no bulk and meager offensive stats. Let it be said now that he is quite possibly your best friend for this entire game, because if you level him up enough and equip him with the right skills, then he quite literally won't ever die in combat while continuously landing critical after critical hits, making him the safest bet for you to send into the front lines in order to soften up the enemy's units while the rest comes in for the kill. On the other hand, we have Marcel, one of the two only archer type unit we get. As an archer, he can shoot his enemies from some distance away for some damage, but he is severely lacking in mobility so he won't be able to outrun his opponents if they just so happens to target him which is very dangerous for this stage because Talbot will absolutely murder him if you even let him get near. The most optimal solution for this stage is to split your group into two, with the primary group proceeding through the bridge while the second group take out the enemy archers and spearmen that lead us to the hillside. I will highly recommend not transforming the first chance you get, at least until you are able to reach Talbot alongside Jean or Colette in tow, because even if you don't need to defeat him to win the stage, there are absolutely no way for you to sneak Marcel past Talbot with his frustratingly low mobility. Thus, you'll need both Jean or Colette in order to generate a feel of burning aura for Jan to take advantage while transform. By the time you had reached Talbot, your MP will have been filled enough for you to just break out the skill Flash of White, which coupled with the boost from burning aura will shred some of Talbot's HP down. But beware, what you can do to him, he'll most likely be able to do to you. So it's often a great idea to have a healer near at all times to undo the damages. Whether or not you were able to defeat him doesn't matter. You can only end the stage when all of your units had escaped. Or so you thought. Despite escaping through the northern border and into Sawyer Valley, Talbot and his crew were somehow able to gain up on your party blocking our path with reinforcement and rendering our escape futile. The only way to pass through now is to take out the enemy commander himself, who is well protected by his troops. But then, guess who showed up?
as foreshadowed and hinted in the previous chapter. Gillis is another armlet wielder, also capable of transforming. For this stage, Gillis will be acting as our green allied support, controlled by the computer. After taking down Talbot for the second time, he retreats, leaving Jan to question Gillis about why he didn't tell her about his armor sooner. To which the Sugargate wannabe replies with, Jan affirms that she came on this journey on her own free will. All of this was being witnessed by Roger, who didn't quite like what he sees here. And so, our path to Chinen is now wide open. Shortly before the party reached Shinan, the Dolphin himself along with his court, having heard of John's quest and plight, decided to arrange for her to meet him during one of his many party. But this arrangement was not made out of the goodness of his heart, nor was it because he truly believed in the words about being a messenger from God, but instead, the purpose of this meeting was rather mean-spirited. His advisor, Georges, saw this as a chance to humiliate the person who the country folk had decided to dub as La Pucelle, or the Maiden in English. He is not particularly excited to know that someone out there are putting hopes into the people's heart, and is actively pushing for the Dauphin to stay his hands from joining the war, which the Dauphin nonchalantly agrees with, seeing it as wasted effort as long as he just remained the Dauphin who barely have any influence and not the king, which will give him some form of authority to rally the troops and carry out the campaign to take back Paris. Now, this is also the first time we saw the Dauphin, the man who is supposedly to be the heir to the throne of France, whose reign will have ended the English rights to the throne and ended the Hundred Years' War. Now, from the first glance, our Dauphin doesn't seem like much. His mannerism and carefree attitude is almost childish for a man of his stature and lineage which is further shown when he decides to go along with his advisor's plan to embarrass Jan in front of his entire court, which will not only bring disgrace to her cause, but will also make Jan to be the joke of the entire continent. But despite that, Gillis, who had known the Dauphin previously, had decided to go meet him beforehand, and came up with a clue of the Dauphin's mischievous action. He asked Jan and her party, What color is Nova Blood? John, look, that man in red! Remember what she said? The color of royal blood! Blood is red! He has to be the Dauphin! No, I don't think so. Huh? Then, who is? Gentle Dauphin, my name is Jean La Pucelle. A miracle! Either through luck, some unseen providence, or just sheer natural instinct, Jean was able to identify the Dauphin to the surprise of pretty much everyone. After pretty much misunderstanding what Jean was trying to say, it immediately leads to Charles happily announcing to everyone that God has chosen him to save and guide France as its new king, all to John's dismay of course. This effectively means that John has now gained the favor and support of the Dauphin, with Charles lending her some of his troops in order to spearhead the campaign to free their country, but unknown to everyone in the background.
yeah, we'll leave this can of worms for later on. A new day has arrived, and with it, the campaign for France has started. Their first objective being to free Orleans, a city that has been recently taken over by the English. But their initial war meetings bears no fruit, as everyone aside from John's party had deemed the attack as pointless and suicidal, under the excuse that you have been the ways of the Dauphin's troops. This, of course, infuriates John, as earlier, they too had also decided to ignore her call to start the war meetings. It was also around this time that Gillis had officially joined your party, serving as the second in command and strategist to the group. Frustrated, Jeanne decided that she is going to head into battles regardless, troops or with no troops, and immediately dashes off to the front lines, much to the dismay of others. It was there that we have our first meeting with the esteemed general, nicknamed La Hire, along with his buddy, Rufus. Sharing some hearty laugh, La Hire and Rufus immediately joins our party as axe wielders. And now, the battle to reclaim Orleans officially starts. Now, the objective for this stage is rather simple. You are to guide John into the yellow marker, symbolizing the gates of Orleans. You don't have to route every single enemy you see, but merely to guide her to her destination and end her turn. But to get there, we will still need to pass through the river and the enemy is guarding the gate. It was also around this time you will start seeing some of the stronger enemy variants and also deal with who to send into battle as your party is getting larger, but the amounts of units you are allowed to send in are still 4 to 6. The Siege of Orleans has always often been considered to be the turning point of the Under Years War, as the city was occupied by the English at the height of their power, and during the later stages of the war, almost as if it was heralding the end of this pointless conflict. Historically, it was Joan of Arc's timely arrival that has finally started to turn things around for the French, as they had suffered losses after losses before finally achieving their first major breakthrough, recapturing Orleans at the time when French morale was so low at the height of English power nonetheless. Despite their victory here, the battle was not actually won yet, as the English had previously erected three fortresses that served as their hold over the Orleans. The first one being the Bastille of Saint Loup, then the Bastille of the Augustines, and lastly, perhaps the strongest and the most well defended of them all, the Tourolaise. Taking these fortresses will almost certainly push the English back onto their own lane and out of Orleans, with the party eventually agreeing on taking the weakest and less defended fortress first that being the Bastille of St. Lou. But unfortunately, I guess we'll have to stop here for now and continue John's tale some other time. For you folks who had watched from the very start of the video, thank you. This video took me quite some time to make, with us barely even scratching the surface of this game's story. So I'm planning on splitting it into a three-parter. Each part corresponds to the different stages of John's journey, with this first part being the introduction. So, I hope you all do enjoy this video, and I will most definitely see you all in the continuation which I promise will come soon enough.